or at thevoiceofstockton.org. This is Barbara Berrigan Perea with Delta Flows, a radio show by The Voice of Stockton and Restore the Delta. This is the weekly radio show where we discuss everything Delta related the environment, water management, water quality, farming, history and culture, public events, recreation, Delta food and the arts. Tune in to Delta Flows on KXVS, the voice of Stockton, streaming live on Facebook and YouTube at KXVS Radio. KXVS, the voice of Stockton, live. The voice of Stockton at Stone Soup Studio. KXVS.org. The views and opinions expressed in the following program do not necessarily reflect those of KXVS, the voice of Stockton, or its parents, affiliates, management, and staff. KXVS, The Voice of Stockton, presents The Lance McCann Show with your host, Lance McCann. Good morning, everybody. This is The Lance McCann Show where we spotlight local business owners and people doing great things in the community. I'm your host, Lance McCann. I'm a local realtor with Keller Williams. My license is BRE987449. And today, my guests are Drew Hunt and Archie Bakery. They're estate planners, and today we'll be going over how to protect your real estate assets. Good morning, gentlemen. Morning, Lance. Morning, Lance. Nice to have you on the show. Good to be here. So, uh, what, is, what is a will? People have this idea that it's just some piece of paper that they scribble on right before they pass away, and that's their dying wish. But being in real estate, I know that it's a lot more intricate than just scribbling your last wishes on a piece of paper. Unfortunately, I'm both a lawyer and a professor, so my answer may be longer than what you'd like. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're here to educate, so uh, take Open your, your time. textbooks to page. The, uh, your description of a will, and interestingly enough, is something you scribble. Actually, that can be a will. It's a thing called a holographic will, which can be in handwriting. Not advised because you might make some mistakes on it. Okay. More typically, it's a, it's a formal document prepared by an attorney and witnessed by at least two witnesses, which directs how you want your property to be distributed and other things such as guardians for your children to be nominated in that document. Okay, so if somebody was dying before their children were the age of 18 or the age of majority, they could set up a guardianship through that will. Well, technically what they're doing is they're appointing someone as a guardian, but the court has to officially approve it. Approve them. And is that before... Um, they pass on or after they pass on? After they pass on. Interesting enough, Drew and I talked about this yesterday, a will has no effect until the person's dead. Okay. Okay. That's, right. that's, it just sits there. It's just a piece yeah. of paper at that yeah. point until it... Uh, you know, I wanted to point out because, um, Archie, it's actually, you have one of the, for the local area, Archie is one of only 15 state board certified um, attorneys um, in probate estate planning trust um so he really is when it comes to these topics here he really is an expert in this field so, and a specialist he began practicing in 1975 uh, tracy california is his stomping ground <laughs> i think still and um he created an amazing practice out there it it, it is still um up and running baker and custer and belden i'll give those guys a plug i'm not involved officially anymore but my name's still on there so i'm well, I mean, you very built good it. You there. built it. I mean, uh, I didn't realize you were one of fifteen board certified. So, right, and uh, he was also my professor in uh, law school. So, oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So it's funny how. And, and he makes me uh, say he's my favorite student. <laughs> he actually was, but I wouldn't normally say. It. It's, it, a, it's, it's funny because I know Drew. He grew up in my neighborhood. Uh, we won't go into those stories, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Keep it professional, sir. <laughs> Drew's a good, good guy. So, we went over well. So, what is a trust? People hear you hear you know trust all the time, but you know the trust babies and all this stuff. So, kind of give us an overview of what a trust is. Drew, you want to give your well, yeah, you know, right when you said that, it, it started making me think because again, before I was an attorney, I had my layman's opinion of what a trust was or what I believed a trust to be, and for me, it always was something I thought that it was for people of privilege. Mm -hmm. I figured a trust was something that I would never have anything to do with. None of my family members um, at that point had a trust. But what a trust really is, more than anything else, it's a relationship. 
And what it is is you have three main components. You have the trust maker. Okay. There's a couple different names for that position, but I think the easiest to remember is trust maker. Then you have the trustee, and then you have the beneficiary. Okay. So the idea is simple. The trustee creates the terms. The trust, I'm sorry, the trust maker creates the terms. The trustee follows those terms with the fiduciary duty. Are you familiar with that term? Uh, I am because I'm in real estate, right. but maybe some of our listeners well, the don't way quite I like under. To, the way I like to explain was loyal like a dog. That's the one that always, and, and the idea behind it is you're That's putting good, you're putting the other person's needs before your own. And so the trustee with the fiduciary duty then follows the trust makers, whatever the orders, right, marching orders, for the benefit of the beneficiary. I like the loyal like a dog. I'm going to use that because yeah. people ask me, um, well, this is kind of off topic. I was doing a divorce, and the husband thought I was working in benefit to the wife, and the wife was thought I was working in benefit to the husband. And I was like, no, I have a fiduciary responsibility. But trying to convey that in a simple term, loyal like a dog, I have to be loyal to both of them. Well, fiduciary is a word you don't hear a lot. Sometimes yeah. the, the teacher learns. I that's I, I love that saying. I had never heard that before. <laughs> hey, the you know yeah, what? Becomes, he mentioned becomes those becomes three components. In fact, the trust is no longer the land of the privilege. I, truly, I believe almost anybody who understands this area will tell you that anyone who's over fifty years of age and owns a home needs a trust desperately. It would be foolish not to get it. What's changed in the law in recent years? is that now the individual creating the trust can be the trustor, the grant ma trust, trust maker, the trustee, and the beneficiary, all three of those. Oh, wow. Which gives them the complete freedom with their property that they had before the trust was created. Mm. In other words, they could still sell it, they could still mortgage it, they could do anything they want with the property, but they do it in their capacity as a trustee. The trustee will change over a period of time. Obviously, at some point, that trust, the original trustee is going to die or become right. disabled. And then a successor comes on, so they could appoint a tr successor into the trust after as a, a yeah. trustee. Right. The, the, the trust typically, a well drafted trust, will have at least two and probably three successor trustee nominees. Because mm. when I look up public records, sometimes I'm looking for people and looking at property. I I could tell that they're an older, usually older, because everything's in a trust. The younger people, between their 30s and 40s, don't. And 50s don't have a trust they they don't think about it but obviously there's benefits um, to protect your assets and, and other things Uninfo unintended accidents and so on and so forth essentially what we deal with and what I'm what I'm helping drew set up right now I'm serving as a counsel to his law firm I still teach at the law school but I'm working him on enough counsel basis to establish a what we call a three-step trust based practice. In other words, where it's not just the trust. The trust is an essential part, but there are many other components to it. There's powers of attorney, healthcare directives, other things that make up the entire program. Mm -hmm. It's not just a trust. So um, what is the difference between a will and a trust? Can you kind of just, we kind of talked about it, but can you kind of wrap it up in, in a nice little package for people? I'll give you one sentence. Okay. A will requires probate. Okay. You know, part of the problem with this area of law is the terminology. Because if you remove some of the terminology and you look at things for what they really are and the functions they really have, it's very straightforward. Of course, there's a lot of intricacies. This is the law. Mm -hmm. But the overall concepts, essentially a will needs the court to verify. It needs the court to intervene and say, yes, this is the will, this is their wishes, and now we're giving you the appointed executor or the personal representative, mm. the authority to do what's in the will. So, well, and so what really what a trust is is saying, look, let's keep the court out of the middle of our decisions. Why do we need to go to the court? I'm an adult in the United States. I can contract. I have capacity. Mm -hmm. It's my property. Why do I need the court to come in later? What I'd rather do is appoint someone else myself while I'm alive, and then someone else to come in and follow my wishes, someone I trust, mm. right? So the idea with probate in the court is, at the end of the day, we all have to trust the court, right? but when it comes to the trust, I'm picking who I want there. 
I see. So whatever family member or entity, it can be a it can be a business entity or it can be a fiduciary, a business that does fiduciary duty, steps in that place. But the idea behind it is really it's empowering the individual. You're making the decision now while you're lucid, while you have capacity. So what I'm hearing you saying is it's more like a roadmap to disperse their assets, their income, their bank accounts, everything in a roadmap without having the court going, we have to approve it first. Well, yeah, the, the, the problem with the, with the will is it's, it's basically very simple. It names who you want to see the property, who's, who is going to be the executor. Mm -hmm. Problem is, there's a lot of other issues that are going to be involved, which are not going to be spelled out in a two or three page will. A trust, by the some people got frustrated because it may be a 60 or 70 page document because it covers everything which may come up. Uh, or you normally need the court to be involved. We set up a process in the trust to take care of that situation. So, you bring, bring up a good point 60 or 70 pages. So, the cost, the cost versus a pro, going through probate and the cost versus setting up uh, a trust? Let's deal with the probate first. Okay. It is, we used to call, when I started, first started practicing law, it was called the, the uh, old timer's retirement plan. Okay. You do a lot of wills. In mm -hmm. fact, you can do them almost for free, and you, you would keep the wills as a custodian. Why? Because then when the person passes on, the children will probably come to you and you get to probate it. Uh, the probate fees are extremely expensive. They're almost, un they're too generous. So on a $300,000 home, what would uh, somebody be looking at? 30, 40 grand? So they're eight, statutory. Statutory, it's $18,000. It's 4% it's of the first thousand, 3% of the next 100,000, and 2% over that up to a million. So in your example, it would be 9,000 for the attorney and 9,000 for the executor. $18,000 on a $300,000 estate. And here's the real painful part about it. That's based on the gross value. So if you owe two hundred and fifty on a three hundred thousand dollar house, you still get to pay that eighteen thousand dollars in probate fees. Oh wow! It's outrageous. I mean, it's no sane person who understands this would elect to do that as compared to doing a trust. Mm. So, the only reason, if you look just at the money, if someone were to back off and no emotional, no time issues, no having to think about death, no having to think about what I'm going to do later. Mm -hmm. If you removed all that and you just looked at the dollar amounts, everybody who owns a home or has any property that potentially is going to have to pass through probate would opt to do a trust if you look purely financially. And that's only the first benefit so of So speaking trust. of financially, so what's the cost of doing a trust? I'll give you the answer which I teach, which I really tell everyone. That is sort of like asking a building contractor, what will you charge me to build a house? Mm. The building contractor response is going to be, well, it depends on what the house is going to be. Right. That's true of estate planning because they they range from very simple to, I mean, I've well, done I've I've done uh, planning for people with twenty five million dollars in assets. That's complicated. Right. But the range is from two thousand to five thousand, maybe for your 10, average 000. person, one home, a couple cars. In the ballpark of twenty five hundred dollars, twenty five hundred bucks. So now essentially, the, they could save well in the sixteen thousand dollars. An example we just gave, and, and many people have estates way more than three hundred thousand yeah. dollars. But I want to add, what we offer is not just the trust. So you, you know, when you ask what's the cost of of making a trust, really, what we provide is a comprehensive estate plan. So in addition to a trust and that same fee mm -hmm. to the attorneys, you also receive a pour over will, which is essentially your will. So you update and any other will you've made prior to this one updates it, mm -hmm. supersedes it, and it has a pour over function. So anything in there that wasn't moved into the trust by terms of the will is moved into the trust. We also do an advanced health care directive. And what this is, is this, you, this is you ahead of time saying what you want to happen if you get in a position where you can't make decisions for yourself mm. and you yeah. also appoint the person to make decisions for you. Your listeners may remember the Terry Shavel case from Florida some years ago where the lady was in a coma right? and her husband and her parents got into this long legal battle about who could make the determination. It ended up for like four or five years. The advanced health care director takes that out of the equation because the person indicates in that advanced health care director which person they want to make the decision. I see. 
Right, and, 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 and also what they want that decision to be. Right. So there is no dispute as to what your wishes are. Uh, okay. They're, in, they're, they're so contracted, life essentially, support. for you know, right. I don't want to be on life right. support. Yeah, well, You're in fact, that was in Tribal. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, husband, the, 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 the parent's position was she'd want to be stayed kept alive no matter what. And the husband's position was, no, I know her. I think she would have been, knowing she was in a coma, mm. she would not have wanted to. Right. But <clears throat> as Drew says, this takes that out there because you're putting it in advance. The individual's making that decision. You can even say if I'm on life support for more than three months. Sure. You, the, you, you can, any terms you want. As long as they're legal, they can be in there. And, and see, the other thing about this is really not only are you now having more control over what you want done mm -hmm. in your life, when you can't make a decision, you're also relieving the pressure of family members who are put in this position to have to make this decision, right? There's their loved one in a vegetative state, and they're having to decide, would they want me to end their life or not? Wow. Right? So the time when you don't want to have to deal with that decision, now, who wants to sit down and talk about that today? Not many people. Yeah. That's why people don't do it. That's very, uh... But if you take that time, at the end, what you get, what you save, the grief that's saved, and the the, the, the choices you get to make. Not only that, but I mean, you guys have probably seen it more than most. But I think everybody's been through it. When somebody passes on, the family is torn apart. Absolutely. Everybody has got different decisions. Uh, when my mom passed away, you know, it was you know me and my brother, and and we're twins, and it was just it was a struggle to to know how to deal with that and. Cope well, with it at the time, and with the probate, you've got to act pretty quick before you can even get a chance to get your feet in the ground. You have to get something going because who's going to pay the taxes and do these things until you, mm -hmm. until you get something in charge? With a trust, you've already got that set up in, in advance. Okay. And one of the things that I mentioned earlier that I'm assisting Drew in setting up is called a three-stage practice, which is the design, implementation, funding, and maintenance mm. of the program. And one of the services that I'm, I'm going to recommend that he offer is workshops for things like the successor trustees, where the children can come in and learn in advance what they're going to have to do I as see. part of the, what we call the maintenance program. My firm and Tracy has been doing this for about 15 years, and it's worked out very well. Yeah, we talk, I remember we talking about that and looking forward. Well, and you had made the comment, you know, people who are 40, 30, or 40, they're not thinking about trust. Right. But what they may need to think about is their parents who right. have a trust. Who are 70, 75, 80, and what that means to them and what their role is going to be. Because again, part of what this whole thing is about is putting someone you trust in place and then empowering them to make decisions for you. Speaking of children paying for it, I'm going to, uh, something new that just happened. Did in we this bring that up? I like that. <laughs> I like that. So this last year. Under California law, there is a program most of them is called Medi Cal. Okay. There's Medicare and Medi-Cal. Medi-Cal is a needs-based program. It means you have to qualify financially in order to get that program. Right. If you have more than a couple thousand dollars in cash, you're disqualified. You don't get Medi-Cal. Mm -hmm. However, if what happens is they, if you don't, if you, if you I'm have sorry, a heart, you mean monthly? Total. Total. Total income. Total cash assets. Wow. However, what. The trade-off has been for years is that if you owned a home, they would let you keep your home. However, upon death, Medi-Cal had a lien right to come back and take get back their money out of the house. As of last year, one of the greatest things I think has happened in a long time is the legislature says they can only take their lien back if it goes through probate. Mm. So now the children who may have a $500,000 house out there facing a two or $300,000 lien, which could happen if you're in Particular nursing right. Home. By getting the trust done, they've avoided that lien. So that's a no-brainer. So they don't. So if somebody puts their property in a trust, and they let's say they have two hundred thousand dollars in the bank and a four hundred thousand dollar home, they could still get that long-term care through Medi-Cal. Medi-Cal. Without having to touch their assets over here. No, that's a what I'm. That's a more complicated issue. Okay. Probably need a whole program for that. Okay. What I'm referring to is the payback provision. Okay. To Just what, what, what happens the when lien. the person dies? In uh, in the old days, they always had a lien. They now look they, for reimbursement. Right. They want what they spent back. The state does. And if there's a house, 
Let's take it out of the house. Mm, okay. Now the law says if it doesn't pass through probate, then there's no time for them to enforce the lien, and they don't have a right to the reimbursement. Okay. So by putting it in the trust, you avoid the probate. You would say. So the save, point, I think, the estate saves well, think, hundreds of thousands, which of means dollars. the child benefits. That's the point. Right. So I think what Archer was getting at, and this is something we've been working on, trying to get that message out there, is there is a financial benefit for the children to put their parents' assets, their parents' real property into trust for their, not only for the benefit of their parents, mm -hmm. because a trust does a lot more than just protect your assets, but it also protects the children. Mm. So our thought process is, let's reach out to the children, and it might almost make sense for the children to pay the fee on behalf of. Right, because sometimes the The benefit will be theirs eventually. It will be right. theirs, but uh, I've come across people who don't have, you know, their fixed income. They don't have, you know, twenty five hundred, three thousand dollars. Absolutely, no, we see that. We see that. But they have a two hundred thousand or three hundred thousand dollar home, but they're living on a meager budget, trying to scrape by. In fact, th this sets, fits into another thing, which is a topic for another program, I'm sure. But sometimes we see this happen. I've had it happen where I've I had a lady in Tracy. I remember some years ago had a $300,000 house, was living on $600 a month oh, wow. on a pension. And I recommended to her and to her children, go get a reverse mortgage, which she did. Why should you live in poverty? Right. And so they did that, and, and, and the, the children benefited tremendously because of that. Because their mother was a relief. They, they well, they were they were relieved because they, they they were relieved from the financial burden, and then the mother could wouldn't have to live on right. top ramen. Right, top ramen. Yeah. Put some yeah, cheese on it. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to finish my thought also going backwards because I was talking about the package. Mm -hmm. So the advanced health care directive, which we were discussing. In addition to that, there is a HIPAA waiver, which essentially you sign someone, you put designate somebody to be able to receive because HIPAA restricts the the ability to get people's um, individuals health care documents okay. or information information regarding it's not what we're very well enforced anymore but the HIPAA law is strictly literally read says you can't even tell someone is in the hospital the hospital cannot release that information so it's a, it's a oh. real problem if you don't have the HIPAA release is an important yeah so problem. if you call a hospital is a Drew here, Drew Hunt in the do, hospital. Do you, have health care, you. do you have a health care directive? Do you right. have an authorization? And so in addition to this health care directive, you're getting these HIPAA releases. This is part of the package. Okay. So that is for your um, health care. We also then do a durable power of attorney. Maybe one of the most important parts of the document in my mind. And the reason for that is, if you don't mind me explaining this. No, part, please. Is you're a specialist, <laughs> one of 15. So <laughs> Thank you. If there's anything worse than a, than a death probate, it's called a living probate. It's, it's a conservatorship. As people, if we took 100 people here, the odds are that they're three times more likely to become disabled in the next year than they are to die. Mm -hmm. If someone, particularly a single person, if they become disabled and they made no planning whatsoever, who's going to pay the taxes on their house? Who's going to pay their health insurance? Who's going to pay their registration uh -huh. for their car? So the, the person that's going to do that is going to be someone who's called a conservator, which involves you going to court, posting a bond, having an investigator do a background check. By the way, before you pay the attorney, that's going to cost you about three or $4,000 just for the bond, the investigation, and the family. Oh, wow. And then everything that you're going to be doing of any consequence, like where the person lives, uh -huh. has to be approved by the judge. You have to do an annual accounting of every nickel that is spent. So... So, so, I mean, so it is, it is the a courts terrible. are all in your business. Right, because the conservator that's appointed then owes a duty back to the court because the court is overseeing to make sure the conservator is doing what's in the benefit. So if it's in a trust, who does that trustee report to? Nobody. Well, well the beneficiary. The fiduciary right. duty, loyal like a dog. Right, right. But uh. the court stays out. Now, 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 that's a little misnomer because, of course, as with anything, the court can get involved. Mm -hmm. If there's disputes, you still have rights. Right. And the beneficiary has rights or the beneficiaries Aries, absolutely right. so there, there is a specific probate code provision which is a nice one which authorizes a ben beneficiary or a relative various people to bring this trust under the supervision of the court okay and sometimes I've seen that have to happen because you have some problems that 
you need yeah, a, ju- a lot you, of infighting. You need a referee. You know, if there's five or six brothers and sisters, it, it could get really crazy. Right, right. Um, so you avoid the court if that's the intention, and you choose to bring the court into the mm-hmm. trust if that's your intention. Right. Again, it's about controlling what you want rather I than see. and this is a great thing we talk about and, and first of all I want to say we refer to that as living probate so you're going through the probate process but it's while you're still alive because now you're incapacitated well a trust contemplates that position and puts someone in charge to make those decisions without having to use the court costly lengthy delay Wow so and you actually in this case you need both the probate and the advanced and the uh, durable power of attorney the, so the truck you need the trust and mm-hmm. the durable power of attorney. So, um, in all in the will and the trust, how does the power of attorney affect both of those instruments? Well, to, in a well-funded trust done properly, you will, you probably wouldn't need this, but things happen. Right. Part of the process I mentioned to you that we're going to be setting up for Drew is setting up is funding this, making sure all the assets get into the trust. If all the assets are in the trust then the, the, you wouldn't actually need the durable power of attorney. Okay. But things happen. In fact, I call the durable power of attorney a, a super-duper pooper scooper. It's a, <laughs> That's words, a legal term. That's a legal right. term, Lance. If something gets left out of the <laughs> That's trust, a legal term. Mm-hmm. The, the power of attorney is the backup. Okay. Um. Right, so to finish the package, <laughs> yeah, was, yeah. Like, so you have the trust, trust. you have the pour over will, you have the advanced health care directive, okay. and you have the durable power of attorney. And I think durable is one thing maybe we should define. Yeah, I was going to ask you, like, all it means. It's a piece of paper. How durable is it? Well, so what durable <laughs> specifically refers to is that it it um, survives incapacity, meaning if you become incapacitated, it still is in effect. And okay. there's two different ways to do a power of attorney. You can do one that is effective upon execution, meaning as soon as all parties sign, they now have that power of attorney. It's been granted immediately. Okay. The other one's referred to as springing, which makes a lot of sense because if you think of it in your head, it springs into action. Okay. And oftentimes um, that will be based on a specific act and oftentimes that specific act is incapacity. So you're saying, look, when I can't make decisions about my, final, my financial assets that are outside of the trust, the power, the power of attorney comes Kicks in, in because the trust will have its own provisions when you're incapacitated, the successor trustee kicks in. Right. And if you're doing it properly, as I've been instructed, that should be the same person, right? right. So now anything that's outside of the trust, you're able to control on their behalf, and anything that's inside the trust, you're able to control on their behalf. And never forget, the terms were laid out by the person you're now taking care of. Right. So, so it's the, their wishes. The will could be as anything that's not in the trust upon my passing is immediately moved into the trust. Correct. And then dispersed. That, well, that's the will that does that. Okay. But, but, but the concept is the same. And, and some things can't. Like real property, if it's not funded into the trust, the pour-over will will not pass it into the pro, into okay. the trust. It's going to have to go through probate. Or a form of probate. There, there's there's a, what we call a Hegstead petition, which can shorten that somewhat, but it doesn't always work. Uh, Isn't the, that still within probate, though? Or no, is it's that a probate court, but it's not a full flood. It's, 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 it's a form of probate. Okay. And the one thing that probably needs, I really need, your listeners need to understand, because this comes up all the time, a power of attorney under all circumstances is no longer effective after death. Oh, yes, wow. Can, in fact, I was in probate court this morning. A woman was trying to use a <laughs> I got power, power of attorney, attorney uh, for someone's disease. And the judge had to tell her politely, I'm sorry, that, that, that when that person died. I think died. that's kind of a... Uh, a misnomer. People think power of attorney oh, yeah. extends think- uh, until whenever. But well, I'll give you another misnomer on that that I found surprising. A po- there's no legal duty for the person receiving the power of attorney, meaning I go to a bank with the power of attorney and try to act on someone's behalf. The bank has no legal duty to, to accept or to validate that power of a duty. I'm sorry, that power of attorney. Oh, wow. So they could, if you're pulling out money. They can refuse to act upon it. If you're pulling out, trying to pull out money to pay the mortgage, they could go, sorry. It's discretionary where a trust is not. So there's a provision uh, okay. that says that entity has to act upon a trust. They're legally bound to act upon a trust. Wow. 
Man, we covered some good stuff. Yeah, well, it's really, and again, so here, you know, I like that comment you made because here's the best way to think about this. Because at the end of the day, let's be honest, the one biggest concern people really have is how much is it going to cost? Right. But now when you listen to what we've covered in just 30 minutes, you realize that someone who comes in and says, sign here, thank you, here's your trust, how can they really plan for what you want? There's four of us in this room. Right. All four of us want something different. So, we have different children, different home, different ages. Sounds like the, 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 there's a difference between the price and the cost. Right. Well, right, if, I like that. Well, in is. fact, if, if, if we only cost, I can send you to Amazon or to uh, in most places and get an online package to do your own trust. Right. Terrible idea. <laughs> or you can uh, go to uh, what? Uh, Legal Zoom. Legal Zoom. Right. <laughs> right. right. And, and and you may get lucky and it works, but that's I wouldn't advise it. It's like sort of like doing brain surgery on yourself. It's just not a good idea. Right. And the the other part about it is is the second option is to use one of these, what they, we call them trust mills. They come around and they hold. They do. They're usually done by insurance companies. They're trying to get some other thing, and they may do a trust for twelve hundred, fifteen hundred dollars, but that's simple to do because they have one basically one trust, one size fits yeah. all. It's not. And tailored if, to you. It's like if, if you went to a shoe store and all they have is size 8. That's fine. I'm grabbing eight, my foot in I, there. But I got a 12 and it's going to work very well for yeah. me. So the process that, that is being set up in, in, through Mr. Hunt's law office is there's at least three full interviews with a person before the trust is finished up. And maybe more. And so there's a lot of... We spend a lot of about, questions that Drew has to ask to understand in my... I can relate because when I go to a client, what, it's not what I'm going to do for you, how I'm going to sell your house. What do you want? What do you need? Then we'll tailor something around your needs and then move forward that way. The process that typically is done with the client in Mr. Hunt's office is going to be there will be an informational meeting, very similar to what we're doing here today. Well, Archer, before, let me, we actually are beginning with the workshop. Right? I think uh, now that's the informational meeting. It's informational. Oh, okay. right. In fact, we're doing one of those tonight. And that will be where we are going to educate the individual, like we're doing here today. Okay. The next meeting will be individually with those people who are interested in proceeding, and that's where the the client will educate us as to what their goals, objectives, and plans are. Only then can we figure out a price. So we don't charge anything for those first two meetings. So there's no obligation for a person at the time we are able to give them a quote. Because they don't want to proceed, that's fine, and we they go about the way they owe us nothing. Don't you want to know a little bit more about the workshop? Uh, that was my next question. <laughs> when, where is it? Well, thank you for asking. <laughs> Glad you're curious. It's this evening at 6.30. It's co-hosted by myself and Mr. Baker, Inc. Um, it is 2001 Pacific Avenue, right on the Miracle Mile, where Lowe's is across the street. It's actually just right behind the radio station we're in right now, Bedford and Pacific. Okay. It's in what's called the Bedford Hall which is, and get your pens out, so the Bedford Hall, which is inside the art lab. Oh, the art lab. Mm -hmm. I, I know that place. Right. The, the owner's a pretty good yeah. guy. <laughs> They're all right. <laughs> so that's my other, you know, that's something else that I have a real passion for, and that's about the community. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so tonight at 630, and we'll be holding those regular, and, and you can go on the website, drewhuntlaw.com, okay. and you can get all the information we're talking about tonight. We're also on Facebook at Drew Hunt Law. Do you have a, a phone number? That we're we do. Oh, okay, yeah, good. Here's 209. Carrier pigeon. Two, yeah, smoke signals. <laughs> we, we, we can read those. 209-948-3177. And, you know, I wanted to make one more comment when we were talking about the size 8 shoe. A lot of the provisions in trust overlap. So there's going to be a lot of provisions within these um, on LegalZoom or um, the mill mm -hmm. and the ones we create. Because a lot of the provisions have to do with what the probate code says. Right. But the key to it are the details within it. Because that is where you gain the control. And really that is what this is about. This is about how do I stay in control and this is how Archie, there's two things I want to say that Archie has taught me. One, the goal to it is I want to be in control of my assets, my estate, while I'm alive and well. I want to be in control of my life and my assets while I'm disabled. Right. And then I also want to be in control of my assets and my estate and where they go once I've deceased. And a will won't do that. 
uh, a power of attorney doesn't accomplish that. If you want to accomplish those three goals, you have to to have a trust and one other big issue about and the it, four w's i was gonna uh, no no actually I, I, you can get the four i'm talking about at the lowest possible expenditure of fees and costs right because i mean you're talking about two to three thousand dollars as compared to a yeah, minimum so it of seems 000. like the price you pay is uh nothing compared to the the cost of lack of education in my humble opinion and i've been doing this for a long time you've been educating for a long time and my favorite saying that Archie does, I've coined it as the four W's. That's what I, I gave it that. But will you share that with everybody? I love this. I want to give what I have to who I want, when I want, and in the way I want. Mm. Now, it's another whole topic, but we have spent a lot of time talking about at what age do you want your children to receive this money? Typically, under the probate court, they go to probate courts, they're going to get it at 18. Under do, a will. You want, do you want a 18 year old child getting 100, 200, 300,000 no. dollars? The profits from selling the house. Right. You know what? We don't need to keep this house. <laughs> Sell it, right? Uh, oh well, uh, here's 300 thousand dollars. Timmy, have fun. You yeah. don't know what to do with money yet. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you guys for coming in today. Uh, thank you for watching the Lance McCann Show at SellYourHomeStockton.com. If you would like a free copy of my book. My secrets of information for any seller, email me at lancemch at gmail.com. Put in free book in the subject line, put in your contact information, address, and I will mail you out a free book. Join me next week when my guest is Don Singleton uh, with Healthy Home Inspector. We're going to be going be covering what a home inspection is and what it does and how it could help you buy and sell the house. Don't Thank we- you, ladies and gentlemen. And a thank you to Don, right? Don't we give Governor Don Governor a big Don, thank you? Thank you, sir, for uh, being here today. And, and, and thank you, Stockton. Thank you for giving us your ear. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Have a great day, guys. Thank you, sir.